In a, in a long, uh, you know, hour-long improvisation like that, it's, it's all about, of course, just matching style and finding your tools and response. And your, you know, it's it's like I guess jazz improv, but across the disciplines, and um, uh, it's very satisfying and quite exciting um, work that I, that I really enjoy doing. Um, I also I, I work with the voice a lot as well as um, uh, acoustic and um, uh, laptop musicians and uh, uh, there's a um, eight voice uh, Tuvan throat singers choir that I work with which is a very interesting project for me because of course they're all they're all about singing harmonics so um, and they're, they're quite good at it so I get to um, use frequency watches to sample the different harmonics of eight different uh, male voices um, at the same time and figure out uh, what to do with that with visuals and, and also at the same time what um, story to tell alongside it so um, this was a storytelling piece that I um, mounted in a cathedral uh, with, the, with the choir and um, I, I always work with quite strong concepts um, in the performance pieces. They're not they're, the imagery may be abstract, but there's usually a, a single-minded concept running beneath it. So this one was about prayer. So I had 23 interviews with 23 pe different faiths, and they answered the same simple questions about faith and prayer. And uh, their answers were sampled, and their prayers were sampled. And so I was triggering inside the cathedral 23 different religions, prayers, and. Um, um, it was uh, quite an interesting experience, and it was it was very nice that the that the, uh, the Anglicans let me um, ended off with the uh, um, Islamic call to prayer in the cathedral. So you know, just like playing with these sort of controversial ideas using the technology, and um, also I'm always looking to try and um, tackle topics that uh, um, are uh, touching upon spirituality and um, bringing people together. I'm very interested in the different faiths and. Um, uh, and the divisions between everybody, the problems. So. This is an interactive video spotlight that I built using, again, Isadora and the land box. Um, on the bottom, the, the video projector is a little bit dark, so it's a little hard to see them. There may be a better picture in a minute. Um, so I had a grant to develop this idea I had for making a, an affordable video follow spotlight. It's not that they don't exist, they do exist, but they're mostly used in rock and roll shows and non-profit arts organizations can't really afford them. Um, start at like you know twenty thirty thousand dollars a unit for these uh, large yoked um, uh, access video projectors. So this is a version that I built that costs about three thousand dollars, which is much more within the range of even a lowly artist like myself with a bit of grant help. So um, so this um, uh, Vidimote video spotlight I control actually just with my Wii controller and you'll see it um, in a minute uh, in more detail so um, this has reached beyond the prototype stage now and I can make them for other people um, uh, I have a, a, a mathematician friend that I work with a lot and he's the guy who's responsible for the collaboration with the 3D video tonight and he's done all the auto keystoning mathematics for such a problem for video um, moving video spotlight has to keystone on the fly as it moves and uh, as it arrives in a new position has to read correctly in that new position so it's quite a mathematical um, problem uh, so of course the video mode can respond to anything that I tell it to. It can respond to pitch or frequency or movement or simply my will um, using uh, wireless controls. Um, so that got me thinking 
um, a little more. Um, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit to. Uh, I don't have a lot of time to talk to you tonight. A lot of these projects you will find snippets of on my website if you're interested in them more. But um, so this is Alex Novitz, who you may have already met or seen perform here at Time, and uh, we've worked on a, uh, a basic collaboration together, testing some of our ideas, um, uh, sending our data back and forth between visuals and, and sound, and figuring out conceptually why we might want to do that and, if, and, and, and how we would perform together if we were going to go forward with that kind of opening of the floodgates of data between the two of our disciplines. Um, this is the 3D mystic that you saw at the beginning, and I'll put it on at the end again. So this is a museum installation piece with interactive lighting and um, active areas dotted around within the museum that the public would wander into and then discover that they actually had control over something if they were brave enough. Interactive camera feedback situation, as well as um, the images are the image is actually her iterated out, and uh, it's also responding to the music and her movement. It was very popular. <laughs> Some of the pieces have been. Uh, we just seen that. So I'm going to jump forward. This is the, my current project, and uh, that's the reason I can't actually demonstrate it for you tonight. Is because it's too big to, for me to have brought over this time. So on the right, you'll see Ivy um, and me in the background, and the piece is called Ivy and Me, and uh, it's. Um, uh, an exploration of um, identity and technology and uh, so um, my question the question that I ask myself is you know um, if I remove myself from the public's eye by donning a black silk balaclava um, uh, how will they respond to 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 uh, the art that I then deliver through this sort of pseudo fake robot that's on wheels and can roll about with a, it's got the video, video spotlight attached to the top. Um, I've got my uh, wireless controllers on carrying them about with me. So, so I can make the uh, robot appear to be intelligent and uh, appear to respond to the public passing by. I can run interference on them. There's a great big ramp there in, in the entrance to this museum and as people were uh, coming in for the evening before the performance I would throw flowers at their feet, video flowers, or um, try and draw lines or try and stop them in a labyrinth, try and affect their movement, try to get them to engage with me. Um, on the on Ivy itself are two computers, the video spotlights, uh, MIDI controllers, uh, two cameras, two microphones, uh, wheels, and um, also software for live drawing. Um, so I was combining all of the things that I was interested in. Um, I'd actually been invited to give a talk at the museum that night about phototherapy and using art as therapy, and they also commissioned me to do a performance along with that so I decided to use Ivy and make up a performance just for that night using phototherapy so um, the pictures on the left there, I'll show you a video, little short video clip in a moment um, are from the 18 minute performance that accompanied the artist talk and um, I decided for the performance that I would um, uh, subject myself to self what I called self-imposed phototherapy um, I've done phototherapy projects with various other people um, uh, that were much more photographic in nature. So this is a solo performance and installation piece where I'm doing therapy on myself. And in order to create the piece, I sent out a questionnaire online to about 100 people that I know, some that I know well, some that were family, some that are work colleagues, some that are strangers. And I asked them all five simple questions about myself, and it was anonymous, so they could reply and tell me whatever they wanted. Um, what do you like about me? What do you not like about me? Um, and what do you think I should do to improve myself were the three main controversial questions. And then I sampled all of those answers in my own voice and um, uh, performed that 
um, with Stefan and Vivian, my um, improv um, composer and vocalist. And we created a soundtrack from that that I was able to use for the 18-minute um, uh, performance. Um, the other device that I'm using is um, just a regular... Well, it's a nice one, but you know, it's not the cheapest one, but a Panasonic LX3 that um, has an SD video card inside. And I replaced it with a wireless SD video card that can transmit the images to my computer and wrote some Apple script coding so that the images would automatically load into Isadora. And, um, and so what you see on the left picture there is a, is a live painting that I'm building up um, that, that I'm actually using pieces of my body to construct this live image that is made from still photographs and video that I'm creating from the environment that I'm in. Um, the other part of the performance uh, that was also the therapy part is that 20 years ago, um, uh, my first career as a, as a stills photographer was quite um, extreme and controversial with a lot of extreme erotic work and um, uh, heavy... Um, body piercing, uh, neo-tribalism, and, and um, it, it sort of gave me a name that I was then trying to get away from late, a few years later when I got more interested in spirituality. So I decided to also use the whole aspect of who am I as an artist in this piece, and I have a tray of seeds, and underneath the seeds are old photographs of me semi-naked and all dressed up in leather and studs and clear scenes and, and um, um, hidden underneath the seeds. So I'm revealing them, taking photos, incorporating them into the collage, and then replacing them with new shots of myself, as well as using the live drawing through the Wacom, using my remote to move the video spotlight around. And um, uh, so that whole uh, piece um, was able to, to, to be performed because of Ivy, because of this um, sort of pseudo-robot. And uh, so it wasn't until the very end of the performance that I uh, took off my mask and sort of visually introduced myself to the audience. They'd already had 20 minutes of listening to 60 people's opinions about me by the time they actually got to see my face. So I found that really satisfying as an artist and as a performance piece. Uh, so we're going to continue developing this work with Stefan and um, Vivian joining in a live performance of the piece. Um, and I've uh, been invited by the robot lab, at, robot lab at the University of British Columbia to work with them on further developing and robotizing um, Ivy so that, um, uh, you know, that there's some more gadgets that I'd like so that she can identify 3D objects in space, 3D track, camera tracking and infrared cameras and those sorts of things. Um, but I'll just show you a little bit of a clip. Um, on that note... Um, you know, Stein is famous world over for um, helping artists that come here to build instruments. Um, uh, I'm very interested in, in, in finding uh, um, a, a custom instrument for myself as a video artist because uh, I mean, there just aren't any that I, I, I like. You know, I can't pick up a violin or a cello or, you know, I can play a keyboard, sure, but I would like a physical instrument. And so one of the things I want to do is... Um, uh, spend some time figuring out how to redesign Ivy the robot into something that looks more like an instrument than a bunch of computer gear on wheels. And uh, so that's going to be the next iteration of Ivy. And um, Ivy stands for, by the way, interactive virtual you and me. So I'll just show you a little clip from that.
I'm not going to play the whole thing. What I'm doing now is I'm just I'm drawing the stage that I'm about to step onto and perform on. So before I actually do it, I build it on the floor and um, then uh, start to engage with it. And um, I'll just jump ahead a little bit. For me, it's more intriguing and pleasing every time. Put it up because it's first something we like about pain, thin, low energy, and what's lost. What do I look like now? Healthy, strong, vital, and somehow quite glamorous. Other than physically, have you noticed other changes in me since we met? When we first met, you seemed lost and a bit low. Now you seem happier, more grounded, and passionately engaged with life. Describe something you like. You are spiritually fearless and a truly remarkable campaigner for social justice. Could you like this if you look So I'm going to jump ahead a little bit to the live camera section here. This is, uh, I'm using... Uh, we kept the, the performance fairly casual, just throwing down a black cloth to sit on them. There I am taking the photographs. And then this is the final collage that I end up with. So, um, I'll just go step out of his little right here. really what I wanted to show you was to, to, to explain about the sorts of tools that I'm using. Um, the kind of performance I'm interested in is, has, has uh, changed from um, uh, uh, um, uh, more theater, designs for theater, opera and dance into more of these sort of hybrid um, uh, solo installation performance type events. Um, and I think we could have a couple of minutes of questions and then break for a, for a little while, if you like. We're going to have a break before Tom and uh, David come out and talk. we just turn the lights on for a second. So do you have any questions about... Uh, Yeah, well, it's your job as a designer to build it in such a way that you give them clues and you guide them to it as much as possible. Um, it's very easy for interactive designers to assume that people are going to engage the way that you want them to. And uh, uh, the, the best thing to do is to test your installation on friends and family first and figure out um, what it is that, you know, 
What, what are the uh, triggers, for instance, that they're going to miss, that they're not going to find, and make them easier to find. You know, so um, uh, people get bored very quickly if they can't make the um, installation do, uh, do anything that gives them immediate feedback. So it's good to give them some stuff that, um, that happens easily and other stuff as they get deeper in that they can get a deeper... It's a bit like um, video game players, you know, you have to get to the next level. Uh, so you give them, you've got to keep giving them rewards or they'll walk away very quickly. Um, with. Um, and it's up to you if you want to give them, you know, a cheat sheet, why not? Um, I've seen plenty of installations that do that. Uh, you have a, a, some information somewhere for them to read so that they know exactly how everything works. Um, probably 80% of the people that come in won't bother to read it anyway. So they'll be the ones who try to figure out how to do it by themselves. The other 20% who are that kind of type or person will study it carefully and then walk over and make everything work and feel very good about it too. So, you know, you, you, you can only lead them there. You can't force them to, 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 to make the installation do exactly what, what you want them to do necessarily. And, and that would be kind of boring then anyway. If you're making an interactive installation, you want to program in um, options. Again, Not really. Uh, well, yeah, it's it, it's some of it's a gamble, but it's it's your job to make it work. You you have to figure out. You have to lead them to the trough. Anybody over here got a question? Or? What do you mean with uh, visual music? What I mean by visual music is. Um, Visual imagery that is generated by music, so particle systems, um, rather than cinematic, which I would call an interactive film. So I, I've, I've done both styles of work, and, and visual music is a term that's used, I don't know if it's used as much in Europe, but in North America it's a recognized term um, that means um, Imagery for music, imagery that responds to music, imagery that sometimes is actually drawn mathematically by sound, like a screensaver that responds to sound, that's using math mathematical algorithms to generate imagery. Um, so it's, it's, it's visual music, it's, it's imagery that is rhythmic or th that is musical in some way. And it, it can be very abstract, there's all kinds of different visual music artists. Um, in North America. I don't know what term they would be using in... in uh... Well, it's just because I, I'm not familiar much with video. Okay, yeah. Know. Yeah, and then, then there's also a, another term which would be interactive or live films. So live films, that term tends to get used more... Um, for instance, I'll, I'll perform... I'll get commissioned by an orchestra or an ensemble to make a film for a specific piece of music and I have carte blanche to do whatever I want, so I'll create a script actually in my mind of what this music is about for me, and then I'll go out and actually film the material for it, and then I will build and design a patch for it that I can perform live with the orchestra, um, and uh, so the orchestra can perform it at whatever the, the conductor can set, whatever tempo they want, and I keep my film and my script perfectly in time to the orchestral performance with my own triggers, but I'll build in some interactive parameters for uh, sound as well so that the audience gets some physical experience of the film responding to sound and pitch and motion. Um, but those films tend to be a little bit more poetic, a bit more... I like doing cinematic visual poetry as well, not just um, abstract kind of... Um, some of visual music is very much seems like... Um, it's just algorithmical drawing driven by sound. It's interesting. Um, uh, some of like processing is another software, and pure data, and uh, there's some other uh, graphical programming softwares that um, are very, very interesting and nice for visuals. Um, they're less cinematic. With, with Isadora, you, you can you can really be a, a filmmaker still if you want to be. It's just that you can make it interactive. Um, so I, I tend to drift in both directions. So that's why I call them live films and visual music, because there's a stylistic difference. Some of the new music organizations that I have done commissions for, they don't like live films, they only like visual music. There's a bit of a, um, uh, not snobbery exactly, but it's, it's like, you know, it's a genre. And, and I know that when they commission me, that's what they want. If they give them something too cinematic, they're a bit like, mm -hmm. they, they want, they want um, imagery that's generated directly by the music. They don't want my filmmaking choices. Right? They want 
the, this different kind of um, creation. Yeah. What kind of um, um, music do you use? What is kind it just of just a stereo file you're using, or is it right now? Um, uh, when we do the live performance, it depends on the budget. <laughs> I mean, if we've got the time and the money, we'll set up uh, um, five one or seven one surround sound in the space. Yeah, um, during the music that's uh, um, beginning of the material, what is the? Is it just music that's been written uh, and recorded mean, and mastered, and then you just play it, or is it music? Or is it? Uh, does this have something to do with how the musician has written the music? I mean, like voiceable media files or things like that. Um, you use, you use only audio. It's different all the time. Depends oh. on the project, yeah, and who I'm collaborating with. Um, so, because I'm not a musician, if I'm doing a solo piece, then I'm either collaborating with live perform performers who have uh, worked on the idea with me and recorded music for me for that project, so that I can perform it by myself within the software, and then it, then they are pre-recorded. Although I will be. Um, I do uh, feel quite comfortable choosing on the fly which p parts and pieces of the music I play and I can change the pitch and I, they're comfortable with me altering their music somewhat within the nature of the piece and, and other times um, I just have nothing to do with the music at all. I'm simply delivering the visual performance mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and then another extreme is where, where um, you know, we're sharing data back and forth so some of my actions are um, creating music through uh, software um, uh, and uh, um, so that would be the other extreme. Did that kind of answer it? Yeah. yeah, so Isadora can do any and all of the above. So you can bring in live streams of music, you can play recorded music, you can put filters and do processing on, 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 on wave files or live audio streams and you can do the same with video streams. So. Um, uh, it's not really that limited in that way as to how I would choose to use the music. And it has, uh, you have the ability to um, uh, uh, do 16 channels of sound from within, right within Isadora. That's without even any kind of external sound card set up. Um, there, there's all kinds of uh, new options as well in the in the new 1.3 version, which I haven't even had time to properly look at yet, which, like I said, has just come out um, a couple of weeks ago. And the designer of, of Isadora is, was originally a, a musician and a Max MSP expert user, and so he, he, um, he's coming for that strong background of Max MSP new music um, uh, creation. Anybody else? Yeah. I'm going to do a short performance with this in a bit. I'm just going to contextualize it first um, and sort of what motivated me to um, build my own instrument and um, how exactly I've gone about it and what my concerns were with the clues which is here. Um, so the main thing I wanted to talk about was the mapping on this. So the relationship of the input controller, which isn't very exciting on its own, it's a fairly straightforward set of buttons and joysticks, and the output from my own synthesis algorithm. Um, neither of those bits being the interesting bit. Um, the interesting bit being the relationship between this and that. Um, because I, a lot of electronic instruments, that relationship is a bit too straightforward to do anything particularly creative or flexible with in a lot of cases. Um, the theremin being the most obvious example of a straightforward mapping, I think limiting the use of the instrument. Because um, in that, you have one hand controlling volume and one hand controlling pitch, and that's it, very literally. You move this hand closer, the pitch gets higher. You move this hand higher, the volume gets louder. I think that's the way around it is. Um, and that's okay, but it really limits the range of expression you have on it compared to something like a trumpet or a trombone or like a guitar even, and polyphonic instruments. Um, and the, the sort of crux of this matter is, like I say, with the theremin, you've got um, a very straightforward relationship. I mean, this is already more complicated than the theremin, just as functions in between, really. Um, so like the theremin, you have input data, and that input data corresponds straight away to some output data. So um, height of hand is volume, um, distance of hand from the other end to is pitch. Um, it's very straightforward. But acoustic instruments don't really work like that. It's, I can't actually think of a single acoustic instrument that is as straightforward as that in how the input parameters 
correspond to the output parameters. Um, they tend to be slightly more complex. So this was an example of a one-to-many. That first one was one-to-one mapping, one input parameter, one output parameter. This is one-to-many, where a single input parameter can then affect more than one output parameter. Um, so maybe in, an example of that in acoustic realm is the pressure you put on the key of a piano. So that firstly determines volume, obviously. So you've got that's one relationship. But then the way you press the key and the there's a lot of other parameters that are affected, such as the sort of brightness of the sound and things like that. Um, so that's an example of one input parameter controlling many. Um, the reverse of that, many to one, you've got multiple things just controlling a single source. So maybe if I had this, that, and that all contribute to pitch in some way, um, it would be it would give me a more sort of meaningful control of the pitch than just having a single thing controlling. Um, an example of something like that may be a uh, pitch on a trumpet where partly your mouth and your breath pressure determines the pitch and partly your fingers do it, so it's sort of combined input controlling one parameter. And then perhaps the most interesting of all, where you have all, all of that at once, many to many, many input parameters controlling many output parameters through some sort of process maybe, as all of these could be. Um, but yeah, and then in terms of acoustic instruments, just looking at the simplest one you can find almost, there's straight away interesting comment like it's not it's not this one-to-one -one mapping, even on a very basic acoustic instrument. You have um, the breath pressure, like I say, it's controlling pitch, it's controlling timbre, and the fingers are also controlling pitch and to an extent timbre. Um, so it's it's very complicated, even in very simple instruments. Um, progressing <laughs> slightly. Um, again, you've, you've now got it perhaps even more complex. You can control a great deal of, of the timbre with, your breath, with just your mouth breath, pressure and breath pressure. Um, and almost all the parameters are interlinked. Timbre comes from, from your fingers to an extent again as well. Um, and then the electronic instruments start. And this mapping is for the first time conscious, or maybe not at this stage, I don't know, but for the first time it's... it's um, something that the designer has to think about rather than it being inherent in just how the instrument works. Uh, and this one-to-one -one mapping has maybe stuck around longer than it deserves to have. I mean, the synthesizer is just the one-to-one -one mapping par excellence. You've got a million knobs, each doing one parameter of the sound. Even if there's some slightly more advanced ones like LFOs, where there's now a slightly sort of more extended relationship between that and that is still mapped to one parameter, or possibly many, but it's not a complex mapping particularly. And this is then taken forward into software, where you have a million controls, each doing one specific thing, which is very good for this slow, um, painstaking approach, where you set every single parameter as to how you want it. Um, and then max MSP, where it's even more, sort of, it encourages people to do that, because you see a lot of the spaces where they have all this control, um, and you can change a thousand parameters, but only one at a time, or with presets. And it's tricky to do intuitively, and gesturally, and musically. Um, there's a quote from Zanakis which gets used quite a lot. Um, it's talking about um, the, con the, the electronic composer being a pilot. Um, and I think it, this, this is sort of this is an exciting vision. He presses buttons, introduces coordinates, and supervises the control of the cosmic vessel sailing in the space of sound across sonic constellations. Um, so it's an exciting way of making music like that. It's like slowly navigating through. But it is exactly that. It's slowly navigating through. And that's great for one approach. That's a sort of exciting way of making electronic music. But it loses out on anything that acoustic instruments benefit from, which is spontaneity, flexibility, and subtlety sometimes, or certainly subtlety in, in, in gesture. Um, which is yeah, why I started working on this. I mean, obviously, this has been this isn't anything new. People have been working on mapping, um, particularly here. I mean, this is a great place for this sort of thing um, for decades. Um, but this exercise just took a really simple controller and tried to really use the mapping in a strong way. Um, so I'll introduce the instrument quickly now. Um, I've called it the feedback joypad. Um, it doesn't have any haptics involved. I'm working on a project at the moment which does, where you get a physical response from the instrument. This doesn't have that. The word feedback comes from the sound world that it uses, um, which 
involves taking a short impulse of noise and passing it around in a loop again and again and filtering it in different ways with um, tuned bandpass filters and coming filters um, and then delays. That's it, really. It's fairly simple from that point of view. But you can specify um, chromatically the pitch and you can play it if you like. You can, you can do scales and arpeggios and play it quite conventionally. But it gives you access to the sort of feedback sound world, um, which can be quite rich timbre, and that's maybe where it's more interesting, um, controlling the timbre. Um, so as you can imagine, there's a lot of parameters that you can control in there. Filter settings, filter resonances, delays, feedback levels, and so on. Um, more than I can set up buttons and sliders for. Um, so there's, there's a couple of mapping stages involved. This I'm referring to as a physical model because it's essentially using an impulse and a delay, which models what happens in, in some physical instruments. Um, so there's the input on the left-hand side. Then there's some way of getting those parameters to the physical model. It could be a simple one-to-one. -one. It could be a, a complicated cross-mapping. Um, and then on the other side, you've got another mapping layer, which takes um, this into the sound world um, and sort of realizes it through the second mapping. And this is the second mapping to a degree. The way the sort of synthesis parameters will affect the output sound. So tweaking a filter won't have necessarily a straightforward result here because it's fed back, so different frequencies will gain prominence sometimes, and some will come through and some won't. If you set a certain pitch, you might not necessarily get that pitch if some of the other settings aren't right. So that's the sort of second mapping layer. The first mapping layer is, um, maybe I have a diagram? No, I don't, sorry. Um, but it just shows how the controls on this relate to this physical model. Um, so sometimes simple, um, just holding this button will affect six or seven parameters, and moving this will affect pitch and other things at the same time to try and give it that flexibility of acoustic instrument. Um, that's all the sort of introducing I want to do, really. Should I do a quick performance now or at the end? Or? I'll, I'll do a quick one now. I, I'm, I'm not going to play for too long, I don't think. Um, so it's Max MSP is all the software. Um, and it's a fairly straightforward patch. I mean, behind the scenes, there's a lot of mapping stuff going on. But essentially, it's just this um, this diagram is behind it all. But yeah, well, I'll play for you can actually hear what I've been talking about. Quickly.
function because it sort of revolves around trumpet fingering um, on three of the buttons, along with then some um, something working a bit like breath would work as well for pitch. So it's a sort of combination of a few things, but that did take a while to learn. Um, which I sort of think is important. There's a lot of talk with new electronic instruments that it should be pick up and play. That that's great. We can make instruments that anyone can come along and, 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 and get along with. But I mean, I'm not sure how, how useful that is and how much that means you're going to make instruments that are instantly. I mean, if they're in, people love. Ah, oh, wow, great. Um, but it maybe can't go much further. I mean, obviously there's good theremin players, but I, th I think being instantly learnable isn't something that's necessarily such a good thing. Oh. We're going to, no, just move around. <laughs> Sorry, was there anything else? Did you use that or any kind of performances or uh, with visuals also? Um, I did experiment with making some visuals a bit. I wanted to sort of make something that brought out the difference tones um, so that when you bend pitches slightly, you get a lot of beat patterns in the visuals as well as. Uh -huh. So you can hear there's a boom, 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 something that brought that up. I didn't get very far with it. <laughs> um, so it's something that. Well, that would be interesting. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, it's definitely not my main focus, but something that I'd be interested in looking at at some point. Yeah, I mean, that, that would be visual music. Like, the visual yeah. music often is mapping mm. images to sound pitch and form. Yeah, sort of thing. yeah. yeah. I mean, there's a lot of parameters for, for, to play with in the visuals because it's all coming from data in the first place. It's easy enough to turn into visual data. Um, and that would be another mapping assignment of its own. Yeah. To, uh, I was going to ask you if this came up a lot in your work, if you often find yourself looking for more interesting mappings from the sound data to the visual data. or All the time, yeah. I mean, yeah. It is, it's mapping again. Yeah. It's exactly the same process. Yeah. It's just that you're generating imagery instead of sound. Yeah. 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 You're looking at your Isadora. Uh, patch, is it a patch of his adorer? Yeah. yeah, yeah, that was a fairly simple one. Yeah. Most of the ones I use are much more. Yeah, but you could see already there were layers between the input and the, um, the output. Yeah. And multiple mapping is more interesting in visuals as well. Mm. Yeah, it's, um, that makes sense. Multiple mapping from the Well, so instead of um, you know, a particular pitch changing the color of something, so yeah. Then it's changing the color, it's shifting some blur, it's perhaps making the size shift a little bit as well. And then a pitch near it might also be doing so you have these more complex mappings. Because I think it's the human brain. Yeah. It's so complex it's not satisfied with this yeah. uh, relationship. Otherwise the technique yeah. and the, the patterns you see. Yeah. That's what I find always that if it's very precise to map, then then the audience perceives it as very technical thing and you see the technique yeah. in the front of you. If you map it a bit, well, a bit more advanced, then it's becoming more uh, uh, more the art that stands yeah. out, not the technique. But then you have a problem with the player. You need to still to sort of um, have a certain system that you understand as a player. Mm -hmm. It's still um, playable and that you still feel it as a performance that it's not just like random. Yeah, exactly. It's like a, a good instrument, well designed, and then yeah. a brilliant yeah. performance. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A lot of this, the work behind this comes from some stuff at York University and um, Andy Hunt and some other people who, who did tests with instruments where they had the same setup, just four sliders or two to four sliders, and then the same sounds but different mappings and people would say ah, I can I can play this one straight away and I know what's going on but it's nowhere near as fun as Omar. I'm not really sure what's happening but I can make a lot of interesting sounds. Mm -hmm. And did you try um, also um, anything a bit more physical to control this? Because still I mean it's beautiful sounding first of all it's a beautiful instrument um, but still, I feel that it's like very much, you know, also when you pre performed, you were much there, mm -hmm. which could be a part of, you know, concept of the performance mm -hmm. being there. But I always miss with electro, electroacoustic music, electro computer, or basically uh, software based instruments with the controllers, the physicality. Mm -hmm. Did you try anything with Wii controllers or in mm -hmm. combination? I've had a test with a Wii before, but I, I, it's um, the this, this sort of performative physicality of it isn't something I find particularly interesting. Um, 
Because do you do use the sort of model uh, also for a fingering for as a trumpet? Yeah. So that's a very actually physical uh, yeah, physical instrument. But to, to actually perceive the physicality of the performance, I don't think it's that interesting. Or for me, it, like it's a lot of stuff you can do with it theatrically if that's your goal. But um, I mean, something like a violin, it looks quite theatrical to play because it's a big thing and you need to be quite physical just to get the sound you need. But with electronics, there's no need to be physical particularly. Um, and it seems strange bolting it on afterwards as if that was something that was integral to the acoustic performance. Where it maybe isn't integral to the acoustic performance, it's just a byproduct of the acoustic performance. Um, and I don't know, it's tricky. Like from that point of view, you should be able to play behind a curtain. Um, and that'd be fine, but that is never quite as engaging, so it's an issue. But yeah. I, I think maybe there's there's a lot of um, it's, yeah, it's strange this this putting back on the physical element with electronics. Um, the, the thing I'm working on here at the moment is with um, a haptic device, which does require it can apply forces back at you, so you have to apply fairly physical forces to it. Um, so that that might end up like that, but again, it will be a byproduct of of um, just the instrument. It won't be that the, the, it's not. I'm not applying those forces, so you, it turned into a performance. But just so it is, um, so you get a physical response to your hand, so your hand knows what's going on. Um, yeah. Well. Sorry, <laughs> I sort of jumped on your throat with that. Thanks. Was that where you you were yeah. talking yeah. about? And I just want to say I really enjoyed your response because I find that with um, electronic or computer-based um, music, people are always wanting more from the performance as if the music is not engaging enough. And even your question of like, oh, well, you should put visuals on it, or have you thought about this? And um, I'm often kind of stunned as if it seems like it's never enough because you can push it more, therefore you should. And maybe maybe you don't have to, and maybe we have to figure out how to find it engaging or or come back to it being engaging as what it is rather than mm -hmm. I think there's a time and place for everything. I'm not saying, you know, that it's one or the other, but I just want to say I really, really liked your response. But yeah, I mean, there's definitely like the stuff you can do with audio and visual combined that you can never do with one or the other. Um, so it's it's obviously a very worthwhile area, but as a bolt on, it's a bit strange. But if you really engage with why you're doing visual splits, then of course it's worthwhile. Um, but yeah, just it's maybe just thrown in as an extra a bit too often. But. I, I could add too, it's, it's something that happens with all um, uh, technology artists too, and, and the, 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 it's philosophical. <laughs> in the end, you know, they come in up and the, the thing that gets thrown at me is to say, well, if I can't tell it's interactive, what's the point? You might as well just throw a DVD in. <laughs> right. So, this right? so it's, yeah. there's a visual uh, comparison the same way. You see them down the door, but you still see it. Yeah, so, mm. you know, yeah, it's just, They don't have lights on the matter, they just play the dark. Mm. Completely, I think it's matter. You play this, uh... mm. so this is the thing. I just said, it's a yeah, debate. No. It's, a, it's a debate. True, it's and it's whether, nice like, if you, if you can't see the pianist's hands, do you enjoy it less? <laughs> right. But yeah, there's, there's a question around that. I've been, I sounded a bit definite, but it's not, it's obviously not clear cut at all. Even on the music too, I think I saw a performance once by Cluster. It was very, very quiet, and, and they were barely moving little knobs and things like that. Yeah. And everyone was mesmerized. Everyone was sitting on the floor and listening and, and yeah. you know, picking up on every single thing they did. Yeah. Some kind of music really works with that. Yeah. You know. That's that uh, slow piles. The average, but yeah. other music is, is enhanced by it. Yeah, but not everybody needs Lang Lang all the time. They do. Lang Lang, you know the very. Awesome. Well, that's what the modern and actually computer music is going away from. This virtuosity that we had from like uh, centuries before, where all the virtuosity was actually the highest goal of music. 
So we are sort of slapping it back. But I don't think virtuosity and, needs to be expressive in well, a certain physical space. You can have virtuosity without necessarily in that space. Well, more like broadening the, 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 the term virtuosity. Mm -hmm. So it's not only a physical thing and, well, yeah. Well, let's, um, let's move on to the next presentation. But exactly this conversation is what we've been talking about this time. Just the last issue of this is that we're talking about virtuosity, whether it can be extended beyond virtual skill or not. Mm -hmm. Is there virtuosity to listening? And that's very different. Uh, but, uh,